Hi, everyone, and welcome to Steer Week Conversations by IHS Market. Uh, I'm Chad Singleton, and uh, today we're joined with uh, uh, three panelists here. We have uh, Scott DeJeter with uh, Black & Veatch, uh, Lene Wilson from Centerpoint Energy, and uh, Steve Powell from Southern California Edison. So today we're going to be talking about uh, managing natural disasters and uh, building a resilient grid infrastructure. Uh, and I think all three of these uh, folks are, are probably some of the best people to be talking to on this subject. So go ahead and jump right in, thinking about um, uh, investments in, uh, in, in grid hardening and, and physical investments overall. I wanted to start out with uh, uh, Lene and Steve here. Um, both of you have seen you know, really different types of natural disasters impact your territories. So wondering if you can walk us through sort of, you know, what grid hardening investments you've made or plan on making um, and, and how they've, they've overall affected your, uh, uh, your operations uh, in your service territory. So uh, I'll start with Lene and then uh, I'll, I'll ask Steve after that. Okay, thanks, Chad. So at Centerpoint Energy, we have um, electric territories in both Texas serving the greater Houston area and then a smaller vertically integrated electric utility in Southwestern Indiana. And so we have similar types of extreme weather events, somewhat a little more tempered here in, uh, in Texas, but I'm gonna focus on the, on the Houston footprint really in my, in my answer. So in the last you know, 10 years or so, we've seen some very significant events in the Houston footprint. We've had Hurricane Ike, which brought us just devastating winds. We've had um, Hurricane Harvey, which was devastating flooding. And um, most recently this year, we had a generator adequacy um, event during you know, the, the freeze that we had here in Texas, winter storm Uri. So each one of those, um, very different, very, very different. And we learn from, from each one. We've really had historically what I would consider to be more of a transmission focused approach in the sense that you know, we've really worked hard to ensure that our assets here in this area are designed for extreme wind and uh, as well as ice loading. Um, and additionally, we've um, implemented like an anti-cascade design, right, to um, mitigate impacts that you would have from spinoff tornadoes that you would get from, um, you know, from a, from a hurricane or flying debris. So that's, that's really the focus on the transmission assets. We've done an extraordinary job, in my opinion, of course, of, um, of, of really hardening our transmission system. And we've seen it perform admirably through numerous um, different events. Hurricane Harvey demonstrated flooding of a scale that we had never seen before here in, in Texas and, and flooding in areas that historically we just simply would not have expected that to occur. So as a result, we've raised a lot of control houses across our footprint as well as um, you know, critical assets such as auto transformers. So you may walk into certain substations and you'll see them actually elevated on platforms or in some cases close to the coast, we've elevated almost the entire footprint of the substation over and above historical flooding levels. So those are a couple of things that we've done in the high voltage area. We're really turning our focus now towards distribution. And so, you know, historically we've been focused on pole inspection, inspection and treatment, replacement, of course, cable life extension, vegetation management, which plays a huge role uh, in resiliency. And we're looking now to um, enhance our design standards um, to really account for more extreme wind loading on our distribution system, as well as utilization of different types of poles, whether that's concrete or steel in certain situations, such as substation getaways, for example. We're also implementing more technology um, with what we refer to as intelli intelligent grid devices, which is really like a sectionalizing um, piece of equipment that we'll use to isolate and confine um, outages. You know, I talked about the generation resource adequacy event that we had. And um, you know, no amount of those types of hardening efforts really um, provided us any kind of comfort in, in this event, right? And so we've had to think about resiliency in even a different manner altogether in the sense that we've been working heads down um, since that event to enhance our load rotation capability such that we're able to automate more of our load rotation with our existing energy management system, our EMS system, 
and deploying more sectionalizing devices across the footprint to better accommodate critical load. So I would say that those are really the, the key things um, that we've been focused on it really in the last decade, well beyond, you know, well before that, but certainly in the last decade, we've been heads down focused on those activities. Thanks, Renee. And uh, I mean, Steve, I mean, you know, Renee is looking at, at hurricanes um, and, and, and you know, Dupree and, and, and all the impacts of, of uh, you know, these storms, you know, whereas you know, I think your focus has been towards wildfires, but other disasters as well. Can you kind of walk us through to kind of how that contrasts and what kind of different uh, uh, solutions you've used or similar solutions uh, uh, to what uh, Lene discussed right there? Sure, Chad. I mean, as you point out, the, you know, the hazards that we most focus on tend to be a little bit different, but a lot of the solutions aren't all that different. And so a lot of the things that Lene, uh, you know, mentioned are ones that apply to, uh, you know, to preventing wildfires. Um, but, you know, when we look at California, we've got our mix of wildfires we have to deal with, both preventing them as well as dealing with the impacts of them. Uh, you know, large west-wide heat waves have caused a reliability and resource adequacy issues here as well. You know, we've had wind events, so, but I'll focus most on wildfire because that's, uh, that's one where the, been where we put the biggest emphasis over the last number of years. I'd say wildfire has really been part of, you know, our, our operations for a number, for many years. Um, we've made investments in the grid to harden it that would help in protecting against a lot of the issues we have around wildfires, but it really ramped up with, with the large fires we began to see in California in the 2017, 2018 timeframe uh, that really has led to a new level of investment in grid hardening. Um, as well as things like situational awareness and, and operational practices that Lene mentioned, veg management, enhanced inspections. Um, back in the, uh, around 2011, we had a really big windstorm in our territory. And that windstorm uh, had a big impact across a fair, fair part of our territory uh, and led to a, a large program we've been going over the last uh, decade where we've been inspecting and replacing overloaded poles across our system, looking at wind loadings and preparing it for future events. Now those investments in, uh, in more hardened poles and a stronger system have paid a lot of dividends now as we go back to harden even further for uh, a lot of the impacts we're seeing with wildfires. Um, and again, that wildfire, managing wildfire risk and avoiding wildfires for, for us is really a balance of the grid hardening we need to do combined with a lot of compl other complementary measures around situational awareness and predictive analytics. Um, but the core of our strategy uh, that we've been impl impl implementing the last three years is where we are replacing bare wire with covered conductor. Uh, that's one of the primary ways that we can harden the grid and say relatively quickly, as well as at a reasonable, reasonable cost for customers. So it's taking insulate, insulated materials that cover the bare wires that really significantly reduces the uh, possibility that our power lines are going to be impacted and create sparks or, or arcing when they're contacted by palm fronds, tree branches, metallic balloons, or anything else that flies through the air. It's amazing what we'll find up in the lines. Um, since 2018, we've installed um, more than 2,500 miles of covered conductor on our system, with more than 1,000 of that this year. That's in rel relation to, we have about 10,000 distribution line miles in high fire areas that we're looking to harden. Uh, really, it's one of the most important mitigations we can do uh, and deploy, uh, and we're gonna continue to seek support for those investments that are that are protecting our communities. Just like with the poles that I talked about, there's a lot of other investments that we make in the grid that uh, have, a, have a great benefit for wildfire, but as well as for other climate impacts. Um, automatic reclosers on the system and other forms of automation have been really important in allowing us to better sectionalize the system and, and, and carve out pieces, particularly when we've had to proactively shut off power uh, when conditions were, when fire conditions were really dangerous and we were looking to, to help uh, protect our communities. So, and those aren't just things that help with, uh, with wildfire, they help with, um, with reliability and response. At some point, they're gonna help with major earthquakes and the ability to restore the grid more quickly. So as we look at the grid hardening investments that, that need, to be, need to happen, one of the things that we always have to look at is what other things are we trying to adapt to with the climate and what are these mitigations that can be deployed that help across a number of different uh, hazards and risks. Great, thanks, Steve. And, and uh, I mean, to follow up with that, I mean, Scott, I mean, at Black and Beach, when 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 you guys are thinking about um, you know uh, grid hardening overall and the, the engineering aspect and operational asset, I mean, with the variety of, of, of types of events that can happen, I mean, are there um, many you know kind of threat agnostic solutions, and and how does that balance with you know 
very uh, you know specific solutions coming down to you know like weatherization or, or undergrounding lines or as Lene mentioned kind of elevated um, uh, platforms. Uh, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think part of it is is exactly what what Lene and Steve both talked about is you know um, the world's changing and you know we have unknown unknowns out there now, right? You know, for years and years and years we built systems that had you know design bases based on where we are on on the continent what our standard weather patterns are um, you know and now um, you know we're seeing scenarios happen more frequently that um, you know broaden those design bases um, you know and I think the biggest the biggest thing we're seeing with clients is now coming back in trying to use data analytics trying to understand you know what should the design basis be you know, what, what is the, the um, you know, what are we trying to protect against, you know, to what Steve said, you're going out and doing hardening today for one event or one risk. And that risk is continually changing. And it seems to be changing at a much more rapid rate than it had been in the past. You know, so how do we use the data? How do we use analytics, um, you know, to have those platforms out there so that, um, you know, we've got good modeling of our systems We've got good mapping of our systems, you know, and we're able to take those models and those maps. And as new threats come up and new things happen, we can adapt it and come up with new solutions. Great. And just to follow that up too, um, I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, what role have uh, you know technologies like like DERs and uh, and micro? There's been a lot of talk of you know their potential to help in resiliency situations. Curious what your view is on that, and also curious to hear Steve and uh, Lene's take on it too. Of, you know what they've seen on the ground um, uh, with, with DERs and distributed uh, solutions. I think we're we're seeing clients do a lot with DERs, and, and I think you have two things driving that. One is uh, resiliency. You know now you've got battery energy storage that's becoming more and more cost competitive. Um, you know, you take solar and battery energy storage and maybe a small gas turbine or something like that, you can, you know, have a really resilient uh, microgrid around an area. Um, you know, but what we're also seeing is, you know, clients are saying, hey, we, we want these to meet our own internal net zero carbon goals, or, you know, we want other benefits, you know, outside of just hardening that's driving that. Um, you know, we're seeing large clients you know, deploy at scale, um, solar and battery energy storage, you know, across their infrastructure, um, you know, and, and those are, are multifaceted. You know, we have clients that, that are doing it for, you know, um, resiliency, and they're also saying, Ian, I've got this carbon goal out here that I'm trying to meet as well internally. Um, and it's, it's a two for one benefit for them. And, and Steve, I mean, how, how have you seen, um, I mean, DERs, and uh, any potential microgrids uh, in play out in, uh, in uh, the Southern California Edison territory. Yeah, so as, so as we've been uh, you know, looking at it and you know, the events more recently that uh, have been a big opportunity for customers is we, you know, I mentioned before, you know, at times we have to proactively shut off power uh, to prevent you know, what could become wildfires. And um, you know, we are seeing customer, customers begin to have small instances of, you know, of islanding but it's still really limited. It's, it's expensive from a, as a resiliency solution in a lot of cases. You know, generators uh, definitely. You know, people are, people have generators, but the long-term clean solutions are uh, still can be a costly thing if you're just looking for resiliency. You know, the extent that they have uh, good, they're good economic solutions for customers that are you know managing their bills and rates, uh, and it works for the for the loads. I think it's it's a good adder. Um, over time, one of the things we're going to be looking at is how do you uh, how do you design the grid differently in a way that you can take advantage of the distributed resources and the microgrids that are out there. So are there uh, smaller investments that you can have in the grid and kind of have a uh, more utility utility scale or utility owned microgrids um, that complement those other resources that are out there? And then what does the economic model look like? What do the incentives need to look like? Um, but ultimately the, uh, you know, the idea of a vast array of microgrids that are you know, constantly islanding to, to separate from the system Seem, seems like it's a uh, pretty far pretty far out there. But when we look at you know decarbonization, what's going to need to happen? You know, we believe in California there'll be 30 gigawatts of rooftop solar over the next few decades, another 10 gigawatts of customer-owned energy storage, 
And then when you lay on top of that, you know, call it two thirds to three quarters of, of vehicles being electrified, there's a lot of raw materials there to put together a, a very interesting different system. And that's where we're focused is how do we, how do we build that out and how do we really transition? Because a lot of those aren't real solutions that are getting implemented uh, at scale today. See, and, and I mean, Lene, you, you had mentioned also, you know, sectionalizing parts of the grid. I mean, is there a role that you've seen, um, you know, microgrids, DERs being able to play there? Um, and I mean, you, you agree with Steve of, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit of a ways off or, or have you seen any kind of uh, usefulness there uh, during the recent hurricanes? Sure, I, I would agree with, with Steve, at least in my experience, both in, in Indiana and Texas, we haven't really seen it at scale yet. In Texas, we're really limited by the way our market is constructed, right? Um, so as a transmission distribution service provider, we're um, you know, pro prohibited really from providing solutions to our customers that would include anything that could be considered as generation, right? However, in the most recent Texas legislation, you may have caught wind of the fact that um, we had a couple different tools that are now available to us as TDSPs, you know, poles and wires in, in Texas. And one of those tools happens to be temporary mobile generation, which we've actually um, deployed here recently during um, Hurricane Nicholas when it kind of came in on, the, on our uh, south side of our territory here. So, you know, we're still learning how we can use and, and implement that. Um, it's important to note that we are only able to, to utilize it in certain uh, very specific circumstances. So outages in excess of, of eight hours, um, et cetera. So it's not available for, for all events. So I think there's certainly more to come. We're gonna um, see a lot more creativity, I think, out of, out of Texas, being that our tool set has grown a little bit. But I guess the short answer really is, uh, we just haven't seen it to scale yet. Thanks, Lene. Uh so to kind of shift gears here, um, you know, we've kind of hinted at this already, but uh, thinking about digital investments and, you know, what can be done outside of just pure grid hardening. Um, I, Steve, I wanted to direct this at you. I think, I mean, so, Southern California Edison has really, uh, I think, had a lot of headlines lately of the investments they've been making in predictive analytics, situational awareness, um, uh, just the raw computing power there. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about uh, I mean, what's happened at uh, uh, SoCal Ed? What, what you've been looking at and uh, you know, what kind of technologies you're uh, uh, looking for in the future? Sure. So, you know, Chad, I, from what I talked about before, uh, you know, a lot of this does start with just getting the grid hardening done and then we build on top of that. I mean, the cover conductor that we've been deploying for us, it's relatively new. Um, but we're, you know, we're seeing the impacts of it. Where we deploy it, we get a two-thirds reduction in faults and ignitions, um, and, and so it works. Um, but then how do we get better performance out of the system? And that's where technology can come in and help. And you mentioned situational awareness. You know, we've, we've put out now more than 1,500 um, weather stations strategically located in high fire areas on circuits to help have visibility to know exactly what the conditions are so we can better manage the system uh, know what the wind speeds are, know when we may need to de-energize. We've got cameras out there covering more than 90% of the area in our high fire areas. And, you know, when we run our, run our uh, events, that's all important information that comes into, you know, supercomputers that we use for weather modeling. And that weather modeling and forecasting is becomes super critical for us in managing the system. But going beyond that, then the technologies that are actually available and, and on the system that we're deploying, it's a long list of, uh, of technology, technological names, but distribution fault anticipation is one that we've been working with that's sort of like EKGs on the system. It can read and monitor the current voltage signatures on the circuits so that we can better, I think, get, a, get in front of and predict when there are potential problems before they become an actual problem. Um, early fault detection is using devices that are kind of more like sonograms using uh, radio frequency sensors that we put on the poles that then sort of listen for abnormal signals that allow us to identify when there might be frayed power lines or something something like that. Um, rapid earth fault current limit, limiters are, uh, you know, basically like the GFCI outlets in your bathroom. So these aren't getting way ahead. They're very sensitive and know exactly when there's a, uh, a ground fault or some other issue on the system. Uh, it allows us to trigger very quickly and turn it off so that it minimizes the energy that's being put out and therefore reduces the likelihood of an ignition. Um, I layer on top of all of these, the, you know, now the extended use of drones that I think everybody is finding as uh, different, different applications for 
And one of the programs, we call it FORCE, it stands for Faulty Object Recognition Through Computer Eyesight. But it's basically taking all of those uh, drone images that are out there and applying artificial intelligence to and machine learning to basically detect uh, from all those pictures where there are issues. So instead of having um, you know, a human look at everything, we're getting to a point now where a lot of the issues can be detected by the computer. Um, it's still, still assisted by humans along the way, but the advancements in AI and being applied to images is really, really powerful. So, and again, a lot of these don't just apply to wildfires. Uh, you know, they're going to be huge for public safety and reliability and managing the system. And I'm sure they'll end up applying to a lot of other uh, climate hazards. Thanks, Steve. Um, and, and Lene, um, you know, one thing I wanted to um, highlight here, I mean, in a previous discussion we had, I, I think you brought up something really important that I think I, has always been kind of lacking in my own mental models of how resiliency um, happens and how it works. Um, and you had mentioned really the, you know, the human element there and um, uh, you know, building relationships with local communities. Can you kind of uh, um, you know, go through what that process looked like, um, you know, the, the, the partners you have in the local communities and, and leadership around there? How, how does that all uh, play out on the ground? Sure. Yeah. So at Centerpoint Energy, we really, you know, started with what is the difference between reliability and resiliency? You know, and what does resiliency mean to us? And so for us at Centerpoint Energy, it, it really goes beyond the electric system itself to really evaluate critical needs of the communities that we serve. And those needs include water, fuel, communication, health, food distribution requirements, all the things that it takes to help a community get back on its feet quickly, right? Because we understand that there's gonna be damage and it's gonna take time, but resiliency is about how quickly can we restore some sense of normalcy to the communities that we serve. So we've worked to, to partner closely with state, county, city, and, and local leaders, as well as emergency management agencies to determine each one of those individual community needs. Because although we're, we're Houston based, we serve a lot of communities outside of the city of Houston and, and many of them have different needs and you know, are unique from each other. And so we need to be sensitive to that. Um, you know, it's really important to us to have those communications um, ahead of time and early and, and frequent and more normal circumstances because it's helpful in level setting expectations for our customers in terms of how quickly um, we, can, we can manage um, what we can attend to, what our priorities are, and to you know, further establish trust, right? Because together we're all in it for the long haul to restore you know, the system and, and normalcy to the community. Additionally, um, you know, beyond uh, working together to, to set priorities for individual communities and prioritize our investments, we also actively participate together in response drills. And I, I know that's consistent across, you know, all of us here that are, are on, this, uh, on this panel today. But we also communicate widely with all of our customers, um, meaning residential, commercial, and industrial around um, conservation and other important um, notes, particularly around safety, as well as um, communication around treatment and expectation for critical loads and critical care type customers. So it really um, starts with a really deliberate effort around communication, making sure that we have regular and, um, you know, good productive conversations so that we understand from each side what, what the importance um, where they where they believe the importance is, and so that there's buy-in because it is, uh, I, I believe St Steve mentioned it before, significant amount of investment being made on behalf of our customers, and it's important that that at the end of the day, when we go to to recover those costs, that that those communities also believe that their needs have been served, and that's you know that's part of that whole just life cycle of you know from from conception of the idea to, you know, recovery for, for placing that asset into service is, is really for us at Centerpoint Energy built around communication. Okay. And just, I mean, bouncing off of that, um, I mean, Scott, can you go through kind of what are some of the logistical concerns that you, that you think through um, for resilience? I mean, you know, there's gotta be, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really just start with the asset. There's plenty of uh, um, you know, contingencies there. So how, how does logistics play into this when you're thinking through resiliency events? Yeah, I think um, you know, our clients are, are 
pretty keenly focused on that. You know, one, there's a couple things. One is, you know, how do you create, um, you know, I think Steve talked about how do you create those models? How do you create those digital twins, right? That, that tell you where or when you might have uh, probability of, of risk events. Um, you know, and, and we're starting to even see that on the generator side. Like for example, we have our Asset360 tool, which is effectively a digital twin of the, of the power station. And we're now taking that and doing analytics on that to say, well, what happens if it gets 10 degrees colder? What happens if it gets 10 degrees hotter? Is, is, that, is that asset going to be able to perform or is it at risk if those events happen, you know, in the next 12, 24, 72 hour weather forecast? Um, you know, so that we can probably, you know, in, the hope is, is to be able to explain to RTOs and explain to other folks, hey, there's a concern here. I'm not saying we're going to, we're going to come offline, but there's a concern, um, you know, and then how do you get through the logistics of that? How do you set your plans to be able to have the right people in the right place with the right resources at the right time, right? The, the logistics of that are are just monumental and you know steve i live in southern california too and and it's it's you know you you hear that with a fire and all of a sudden it's like okay i've got 48 hours or, or even 12 hours to respond to that event you know the, the planning required to make sure that you can execute that well uh is it's got to be monumental yeah, Scott, and maybe to just add to that one, you know, we've we've made a lot of investment in SoCal Edison over the last uh, seven or eight years in having a structured approach to emergency response. And it's not just after the emergency happens, but it's the prep leading up to it. So, you know, following the, you know, NIMS incident command structure and getting that applied and training up, we have nearly a thousand people trained on a common approach to incident response at SoCal Edison. And it's important that we have that approach because there's so many partners to be engaged with. Um, yeah, we have to be, have a common approach with our state agencies, with local fire authorities, with, you know, with, with FEMA, if ever they're coming in. And making sure people know how you're going to respond is really important to, uh, in advance. Mm -hmm. And then having the resources and the structure to be able to respond in a, in a, in a way very quickly has been you know, really important. The investments in our emergency operations center so that we have both the situational awareness, but then we've we've done all of those exercises so that we're practiced and ready to come in and deal with all the logistical challenges as well as dealing with the community challenges, making sure that we've got the right types of resources to support while we're at the same time garnering our resources to get the grid back up and running. Steve, and I have a final question here uh, for all three of you. Um, this is kind of just going into, um, you know, how we're thinking about markets and the role they have to play. I mean, I think the name of the game here is really, um, you know, climate adaptation. So, uh, I mean, my question to all of you is, I mean, do you think uh, uh, climate ad adaptation is going to be, you know, enough of a signal itself to make these investments to avoid the costs of, uh, of, of damage uh, to the system? Or do you think there's uh, you know, space for um, you know, some of the uh, ISOs to actually uh, you know, explicitly remunerate um, uh, utilities or, or, or generators uh, um, for any kind of resiliency measures that they might uh, put in place so that there's actually an explicit revenue stream? Um, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Steve, uh, of, of what your thoughts are on, on that notion. Sure. So I, I guess I start on a lot of this stuff with, uh, you know, the, a lot of these resiliency events that we're talking about, whether it's, you know, wildfires, earthquakes, floods, the, they are, uh, they're huge and they have large, you know, large impacts, but they also, while they're becoming more frequent, they're relatively low likelihood, high impact events. Um, I think I've always found it challenging to see markets designed that are going to really manage all of the response and all the investment that you need to prepare for these sorts of events. So, you know, I'd say, can you rely on design markets to make sure that the investment goes in to uh, ensure you have a reliable system and can ride through all of these? I have a hard time seeing that happen happening. Um, there are There is a lot of industry-wide and frankly, across industry sort of coordination, as well as risk tolerances that need to be set, frankly, at a policy level that require a very coordinated and integrated approach to decision-making that then drives a lot of the investment. Now within that, there's certainly opportunities to create markets for different aspects of response. 
Um, I think about uh, in California, one area that our ISO has been focused on is Black Star. So the system goes down, which resources are going to be available and ready to, to br help bring the system back on and making sure those sorts of investments happen. So I think you can piece out parts of a response and build markets around some of those resources, but seeing, it, seeing markets as the, the, the vehicle that's going to deliver this, um, I, I think that uh, the pace of change is rapid, the, the amount of investment needs to go in. It's going to need a very strong policy and regulatory push to make um, a lot of these happen. But you know, markets can get built around uh, how you target and deploy distributed resources and microgrids over time. So there's a role for it, but there has to be a, an overarching um, framework that policymakers have, uh, have pushed for investment. And, and Lene, I mean, I, I appreciate that, you know, Centerpoint doesn't uh, you know, own generation assets, but I mean, with what we saw in ERCOT, you know, there has been you know, some, some finger pointing around, um, you know, ERCOT, uh, you know, not necessarily having the right, you know, enough of a reliability mechanism being an energy only market. I mean, do you have any kind of commentary on that of, uh, you know, any kind of role the market could play in this uh, situation? Uh, I thought I thought you characterized it very mildly <laughs> in, in terms of uh, you know the the aftermath of that very unfortunate situation that we all lived through in ERCOT. We do have generation uh, resources up in um, southwestern Indiana, so we're, we're vertically integrated there. So I've operated in both um, ERCOT and, and MISO markets, so I'm familiar with both. Um, you know, we, we have been um, active participants in legislative hearings and, you know, various discussions on how to improve resilience here in the, in the state of Texas. My personal opinion um, is that market changes are a ways off. And so, you know, as a, as a transmission distribution service provider in the ERCOT territory anyway, you know, I, I think it's imperative that we remain focused as a TDSB on how we optimize the tools that are available to us today, because, um, you know, the, I, I, I think it's just, like I said, market changes are, are a ways off. It's very uh, politicized, right? So a, a lot to overcome, I think, in order to, you know, to construct a market that maybe is, is more helpful in, in those types of events. As I said, you know, we do also operate in, in the MISO market. So, you know, there um, we are sm smaller, vertically integrated utility. I can vouch that capacity markets um, are, are great. They don't completely eliminate risk either, though, right? And, uh, and that's a, an important for, for all of us to understand. That being said, I've never seen a generation shortfall in the MISO footprint as extreme as we did here in, in Texas. So I do think that there are opportunities for market improvements. I think Steve made a really good point, whether that's around distributed generation or more traditional um, you know, generation resources that remains to be seen, but I think it's some combination of both. And I am, I am hopeful as a customer that we can get there sooner rather than later. And Scott, I mean, your, your take on, on, on the um, role markets could play in, in resiliency here. Yeah, I think uh, just to echo what, what Steve and Leanne both said, it, I think it's going to be a balanced approach going forward. Um, yeah, I think there's some things that the markets could um, be very helpful for on the generation side, um, you know, to, uh, to help mitigate the risks around capacity um, you know, in, encouraging folks to make capital investments in those in those stations, um, you know, and broadening their operating capability, um, you know, but, you know, there's also a lot of other areas in the market, you know, in, in power delivery that, you know, it needs to be a regulatory approach to, to make sure that you've, you've got resiliency. With good resiliency, you're only as resilient as, as the weakest link in the puzzle. So, um, you know, if generation is the weakest link in the puzzle, then we can have the best transmission distribution system and it's not going to help us yeah, or vice versa, you know, depending on where we are on the continent. So, yeah, so thanks, Scott. Um, so I, I think that kind of wraps it up here. Uh, so, I mean, Lene, Scott, Steve, I uh, really appreciate your time and all your valuable insights on this uh, conversation. And uh, thanks to uh, our audience for joining in uh, on Sierra Week Conversations by HS Market. So I'll see you next time. Thanks.